Thank you for joining us today. I'm Robbie Stewart, and I'll be our moderator for today's webinar. I am a paraganglia of a patient myself. Uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I discovered a paraganglioma in my jugular um, and have gone through a long paraganglioma journey. Uh, last year, I was diagnosed with bone metastatic paraganglioma um, and currently undergoing treatment for that. I'm here with Dr. Dr. Archie Palam and Dr. Stephen Chang. I'll provide a proper introduction in a few minutes. This program is brought to you by the Field Para Alliance, whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and global community of support, while helping to advance research that accelerates treatments and cures. Our next monthly peer support meeting will be held on Tuesday, July 9th at 4.30 p.m. Pacific and 7.30 Eastern. I will be there as well. Our fifth annual Field Para Awareness Week will be held August 26th through the 30th, Planning is currently underway. If you're interested in participating or volunteering, please contact us. Save the date. On September 21st, Field Para Alliance will hold its annual gala in Hartford, Connecticut. You can learn more about all of these events on our website, www.fieldpara.org. The information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctors and medical team because they have in-depth knowledge of your medical history and current situation. Dr. Palam and Dr. Chang will present for about 30 minutes, then participate in a Q&A with the community. We'll ask questions submitted beforehand, and you can also type your questions into the Q&A box accessible from the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to have all your questions answered if time allows. Many people will ask variations of the same questions, so listen carefully for questions that are similar, and questions that are less case specific are appreciated. Dr. Archie Palam specializes in the radiation treatment of central nervous system and gastrointestinal malignancies. She serves as Associate Chair of Clinical Operations in Radiation Oncology at Stanford. She completed her medical training at University of Michigan Medical School in Radiation Oncology Residency Training at Stanford. Dr. Palam has editorial roles for advances in radiation oncology in the International Journal of Radiation Oncology, Biology, and Physics, IJROBP, and serves on educational and scientific program committees for ARS, ASTRO, and ASCO GI annual meetings. Her research is focused on advancing multidisciplinary therapeutic approaches to improve patient-centered outcomes. Dr. Stephen Ch D. Chang is a Stanford University School of Medicine professor and vice chairman of strategic development and innovation in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford. He is also the inaugural holder of the Robert C. and Jeanette Powell Professorship in the Neurosciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. His clinical work and research focuses on the treatment of brain tumors and cerebrovascular disease. After receiving his medical degree and completing his neurosurgery residency training at Stanford University, Dr. Chang joined Stanford's Department of Neurosurgery in 2000. He was named full professor in 2008, and that same year was appointed as the Powell Professor in Neurosciences. Dr. Chang has a national and international reputation as an expert in both microsurgery and radiosurgery for treatment of brain, spine, and skull-based tumors, and is the co-director of the Surgical Neuro-Oncology Program. His radiosurgery practice focuses on the use of the cyber knife to treat neoplasms in the, of the brain and spine. He was instrumental in the rapid growth of the Stanford CyberKnife Radiosurgery Program and is currently co-director of this program. Dr. Chang's research focuses on clinical outcomes for radiosurgery of brain and spine tumors. His lab has active research projects involving genetic analysis and atrovenous mal malformation patients. He is the director of the Stanford Neurologist Oncology Program, Neurogenetics Oncology Program, excuse me, and the director of the Stanford Neuromolecular Innovations Program. He has authored or co-authored more than 300 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. Dr. Plum and Dr. Chan, Chang, welcome. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, and thank you uh, for having um, me and Dr. Chang on today. We are really looking forward to this opportunity to talk about radiation and radiosurgery. I think a lot of um, folks have 
a lot of questions about radiation and, you know, it seems like a black box, I think, to a lot of patients. And so we're always happy um, to um, uh, give talks and help educate. So let me share my slides. Um, can you see my slides okay? Okay, great. So um, I'll start with just some um, background on radiation and then I think Dr. Chang will um, take, uh, 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 take over and go over some cases. So I know that many of the folks on this call are already familiar with paragangliomas. Um, I won't go into the background of that. Um, I will just dive right in in terms of um, uh, going over radiosurgery and what it is. Um, so compared to conventional radiation, radiosurgery involves delivering uh, a single uh, high dose of radiation a fraction of high dose radiation precisely to target um, using advanced imaging and treatment technology. Um, since uh, some of the initial um, approaches to this treatment, we have been able to uh, fractionate. And so uh, th we think of radiosurgery in the United States as anywhere between one to five treatment sessions. And this is um, a treatment that is very well tolerated and convenient for patients, especially compared to um, more of the conventionally fractionated courses of radiation, which could be over um, five weeks every day. And so there are um, multiple different radiosurgery uh, treatment platforms, and uh, you all may have heard uh, some of these names. Um, so Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife. Um, this is a nice uh, picture that I found that I think illustrates the different treatment platforms very well. So. Um, a shows a uh, gamma knife. Um, this is uh, a way to uh, deliver radiosurgery, uh, and this is um, using cobalt-60 sources that are um, placed um, basically like around a helmet-like structure, and all of these um, um, beams intersect to produce a high dose to the tumor. Um, conventional LENAC radiosurgery is shown here in B, and so the radiation beams are produced by a gantry that rotates and pivots around the tumor. And so this is probably the most accessible type of radiosurgery. Most radiation oncology uh, departments just have linear accelerators. And then um, C is uh, another radiosurgery treatment platform called the CyberKnife. Um, this platform involves a small linear accelerator that's mounted to a robotic arm, and this arm aims radiation beams at the tumor from different directions. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to perform radiosurgery, but essentially um, all of these different ways are involve, you know, the intersection of many radiation beams to uh, um, precisely target tumor with high doses of radiation. Um, so this is a picture of gamma knife. Um, again, you can see the radioactive cobalt fault sources, um, uh, the beams intersecting at the target uh, to treat it. Um, previous versions of gamma knife required um, this head frame to uh, localize, to help um, uh, stabilize and um, localize uh, the treatment. Um, newer versions uh, don't require this head frame. And this is a treatment that was developed by a Swedish neurosurgeon in 1951. And um, the um, CyberKnife treatment was developed by one of our Stanford radiation, uh, sorry, Stanford uh, neurosurgeons, um, Dr. John Adler. And he actually did his fellowship uh, with um, Dr. Lexell, the um, Swedish neurosurgeon. And his thought was, you know, if we could come up with a way to um, deliver radiosurgery without relying on this stereotactic head frame. And so um, CyberKnife is a way to um, do frameless targeting um, and we're able to ensure the accuracy of the treatment with these X-ray sources. Um, so these cameras that are mounted on the ceiling and the image uh, detectors on the floor. And then um, the patient would lie on this table. This is the linear accelerator on the robotic arm. Um, that delivers the radiation. Um, and this is the evolution of CyberKnife radiosurgery. This is, again, developed at Stanford by Dr. Adler. Um, 1994 was the first patient treated. This is in kind of the oldest model. And you can see that over the years, it's um, uh, 
improved significantly. So um, 1999, it was approved for intracranial treatments and 2001, because we it doesn't rely on that head frame, you're able to use um, this platform to treat uh, targets outside of the brain. So at Stanford, we use the cyber knife to treat uh, targets and tumors within the brain as well as outside of the brain. And so here are some of the newer models on the right. Um, so when is radio surgery recommended? Um, this applies to uh, paragangliomas as well as many other tumors uh, that we treat. We use the cyber knife, again, to treat benign as well as malignant tumors and the brain and the spine. And so um, we can use radio surgery to treat in areas um, where surgery is challenging or risky. Um, we can use radio surgery to treat residual or recurrent tumors after prior treatments. Um, we can use this to treat patients who are not good candidates for surgery due to um, comorbidities or overall health. Um, this is an option if patients prefer a non-invasive treatment alternative to surgery. And I think importantly, I want to note that this usually does not preclude uh, surgical salvage options. So um, I think that's a question we um, receive frequently. Um, in terms of the um, overview of what radio surgery um, entails, so typically um, if after we meet a patient in clinic and recommend radio surgery, we'll bring them back for a simulation session. And so this is a session um, in which no treatment is delivered, but what we think of as a preparation session. So um, this is a session where we have the patient in the treatment position, so laying on the treatment table. Um, we make um, a mask to mold around their face, you can see in this picture. And then um, we acquire all the images that we need for the uh, radio surgery, surgery uh, planning. Um, and so we usually get a CT, um, an MRI of the skull base, uh, and then I have been getting um, Dota tape pets as well as a separate temporal bone CT. Um, I'll show you some pictures, but um, these can help us uh, uh, delineate the tumor and, um, and um, make sure that the um, plan is uh, based on the most up-to-date um, imaging. And then it takes us usually a day or two to uh, make the radiation plan. And so this is a very collaborative effort at Stanford, um, I work very closely with Dr. Chang. Um, we treat um, a lot of patients with cyberknife, so we work closely um, to um, delineate the tumor using all of the scans that we require at the simulation and uh, make a good radiation plan, um, targeting the tumor, minimizing dose to the normal um, adjacent structures. We also have dosimetrists as well as physicists who help us with making a good plan. Once we make a plan and are happy with the plan, then and we do all the uh, quality assurance steps, then the patient comes back and undergoes treatment, which again can be one to five sessions. So one to five days of treatment, it's one session per day. Um, each session is usually under an hour. Um, and here are some examples of the images that we acquire um, during simulation that can be helpful. So here, is um, this uh, skull base MRI showing the tumor at the skull base. Um, and if you just use the MRI, um, you can uh, miss uh, some tumor because um, below is a Dota tape pad of the same patient. And you can see the Dota tape actually shows the um, tumor tracking um, all the way down the neck. And so with this bigger target, um, it's probably better treated with something that's a little bit more fractionated than with radio surgery. So I'm just highlighting the importance of um, the imaging that we get um, to delineate um, the target and plan our treatment. And then this is um, just an example of uh, the temporal bone CT in the same um, patient. And you can um, see very well in the scan the uh, soft tissue mass that's uh, centered and the uh, left jugular fossa with erosion of the surrounding bone. Um, this is from a nice review article on radio surgery for paraganglioma showing some of the common radio surgery doses that we use to treat these tumors on um, that, that have been published in um, uh, various series using the um, different radio surgical platforms, so the linear accelerator, cyber knife, gamma knife, and you can see that um, the uh, uh, 
treatment schedules range anywhere from a single session to five sessions. Um, in terms of side effects, um, this treatment is pretty well tolerated. Um, it all depends, the side effects all depend on where we treat, um, what we treat. So um, I think we often have patients who have, you know, um, head and neck radiation, but they develop an issue in another part of the body and they have questions if this is related to the radiation. Um, probably not. Um, any, any of the radiation side effects are just related to where a patient gets the radiation. And so um, depending on where the target is, you know, patients may have skin irritation, uh, sore mouth or throat, um, nausea, ear stuffiness or fluid in the ear, feeling dizzy, dry mouth, taste changes, swelling in the treated area. Um, many of these are temporary and get better um, uh, a few weeks after the treatment. Um, some uh, permanent side effects um, that patients are concerned about, you know, depending on how close we are to the cochlea, the radiation can impact uh, hearing. Um, also, there's some concerns about carotid, carotid stenosis in terms of radiation near the blood vessels. Um, however, I do want to point out that the doses that we use for treating this type of tumor is much lower than um, the radiation doses we use to treat um, something like a head and neck cancer. So um, I would say the concern for this probably is a bit lower. And then um, there's always a concern with cranial nerve injury with any kind of local therapy at the skull base. But again, um, the doses that we use, um, I would say a cranial nerve injury from radiosurgery uh, for this type of tumor is extremely uncommon. Um, and then in terms of follow-up, we'll usually see patients back um, every six to 12 months with imaging, and um, oftentimes we'll need to coordinate it with some of their other surveillance imaging. Um, I did want to uh, speak specifically about secondary malignancy associated with, with radiation. I think this question com commonly comes up um, anytime we're talking about radiation, particularly in younger patients. Um, so secondary malignancies are cancers that arise because of radiation exposure. Um, I think this is more of a concern with um, non-radiosurgical radiation techniques where we may tr be treating bigger areas with radiation. Um, radiosurgery probably minimizes this risk because it minimizes radiation exposure to the surrounding healthy tissues. And there have been uh, multiple studies looking at this question, and um, all of them show that uh, a second cancer caused by radiosurgery um, for patients with benign tumors is very rare, so um, no higher than kind of the baseline rates. Um, and then I wanted to just share a few studies um, directly comparing the efficacy of um, primary radiosurgery or radiation with uh, traditional surgery. Um, we don't have great comparative data. A lot of this data is retrospective and has selection biases. Um, but um, this is a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that Dr. Chang and I were involved in. Um, this study included over a thousand um, head and neck paragangliomas in the literature treated with radiosurgery and found that um, this treatment was associated with ex um, excellent local control, so 94%. And then in terms of um, clinical outcomes after the treatment, um, the majority of patients treated with radiosurgery had reported um, stable or improved clinical outcomes after radiosurgery. Um, and this is um, hearing, and, and these are outcomes like hearing loss, pulsatile uh, tinnitus, and cranial nerve palsy, and only 1.7% had permanent deficits after treatment. Um, and then um, this is from the same paper and looking at studies that did both, that reported both radiation and surgical outcomes. Um, the morbidity of surgery uh, was higher and surgery had lower chance of uh, uh, local tumor control. Um, again, you know, these studies are um, retrospective and have a lot of biases, but um, this is some of the few data we have um, comparing local therapies for this type of tumor. Um, this is another um, study of um, 
looking at radiosurgery for paragangliomas. This um, paper included 67 studies of over 2,000 surgically treated patients and 17 studies of um, 100, over 100 patients treated with radiation. Um, both surgery and radiation had good long-term control of um, these carotid body paragangliomas. Um, but the reported cranial nerve deficits was higher with surgery, so 22% versus 0% with radiation. And then finally, we looked at our Stanford radiosurgery experience. Um, I think this paper is under review, but um, we looked at 44 patients with 50 head and neck paragangliomas treated with radiosurgery um, the past uh, 20 years and um, found that um, Local control was good overall, so 98%. Um, and this is, you know, um, local control by location of the tumor and um, facial nerve function and hearing status was also um, uh, stable in the large majority of patients after radiosurgery. And then finally, just um, a slide on radiation for extracranial perigangliomas. Um, again, studies for radiation for perigangliomas below the neck is probably even more limited than. Um, um, what we have for head and neck paragangliomas. Um, and I think the um, considerations for radiation in these sites um, are based on uh, the organs at risk, which are different, you know, um, like treating in the abdomen or lung compared to treating in the head and neck. And there are um, uh, special techniques that we would need to use to be able to safely treat these tumors with high, um, with, um, uh, high rates of local control. So there's um, uh, some motion management considerations that we would um, need to incorporate in, into our radiation treatments to be able to effectively treat these tumors. Um, okay, so let me stop sharing. And then I will hand the floor over to Dr. Chang to go over some cases. Oh, I think you're muted, Dr. Chang. Yeah, Dr. Chang, you're muted. Okay, there. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to present uh, four cases today and and walk through um, the, the process of how we target the radiation um, and uh, kind of the nuances of each particular case and then show some uh, outcome studies uh, for each case. Uh, I, uh, if you recall a few slides back, um, Dr. Palm um, showed that the main difference between surgical outcomes and radiation outcomes, the radiosurgery outcomes, were not in the ability to control the tumor. Both were in the kind of the low to mid 90% um, tumor control rates. But there was a there was a large difference in the morbidity of the cranial nerves um, with the surgical um, series reporting 22% and the radiosurgical series reporting uh, 0%. So that's a huge difference. And even among the surgical series where they reported 22%, um, uh, approximately half of all the surgical series for um, these type of tumors um, when discussing outcomes um, don't even report the complications. They would just report like whether the tumor recurred or not. Uh, so the 22% cranial nerve um, deficit uh, rate is probably uh, uh, on, the, on the lower end of, of actuality. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's the case. So um, uh, first case study is a 64 year old male um, he had a history of a left temporal AVM, which is an abnormal cluster of blood vessels, um, uh, thought to be congenital, um, but it's an abnormal cluster of blood vessels in the brain. And he suffered a hemorrhage uh, from this, which left him with some neurologic deficits. And as part of the treatment process for this AVM, uh, the patient underwent some MRI scans uh, of uh, of the brain. And typically when you get an MRI scan of the brain, you get that part of the neck. And he was found to have this um, lesion in the neck that uh, ended up being um, uh, 
uh, a tumor that was gradually en enlarging. So um, it was a, a, a paraganglioma tumor that uh, was treated with radiation. And uh, we'll, sh we'll show you the um, treatment plans here. Uh, so this is uh, a, a typical uh, type of view that we see on the computer when we plan radiation. Um, this is looking at some, some CT images, but uh, we see an axial view, which is a horizontal view through, through the head. We see a vertical uh, um, a coronal view, which is a, um, a perpendicular plane through the head. And this is a sagittal view, which is a profile view. And uh, the we outline the tumor on each slice. So it's a can be a very laborious process if you have many slices, but we outline the tumor in this red line. And then we're trying to deliver uh, a dose of 14 gray. This is a unit of radiation uh, to this tumor. And you can see the green line is the 14 gray dose line. And I think the, this slide gives you a very good idea of how well you can contour the tumor with the radiation dose. So the tumor is in red, the green line is our target radiation dose, and you can see a very good conformality uh, of, the, of the tumor through all the different planes here. Uh, the other thing with uh, radio surgery is unlike conventional radiation, which tends to be a wider field, the radio surgery is a very focused radiation. And so you have a very rapid fall off of radiation, which you can see in these other lines here. So the light blue line is, is eight gray. So we went from 14 to eight. And then as we get to the um, darker blue lines, you can see much lower doses of radiation. So there is a little bit of a kind of a halo effect, but um, the the vast majority of the high dose of radiation is, is very specifically targeted uh, to the tumor. So this is um, the, the patient's tumor, what it looked like on an MRI scan. And when we treat on the CyberKnife, we actually fuse the MRI and the CT scans together. So we're actually able to look at both, both sets of images when we plan the radiation. Uh, but this is uh, on the left side, you'll see the um, MRI scan prior to the radiosurgical treatment. Uh, you'll see the tumor is, uh, appears right here. Uh, we have some cross-sectional measurements on there. Uh, these type of paragangliomas uh, are, are almost uniformly uh, uh, contrast enhancing uh, evenly. So the, the tumor looks like a even white gradient through the tumor. Uh, on the right side of the screen, you see this uh, patient two years after the radio surgery. And there's a couple of, of findings to note. Uh, first is that the tumor turned darker in the center. And we see that commonly as the tumor undergoes an, its dying process, what we call the necrosis. And that um, is a normal finding. Um, sometimes once the tumor is completely dead, it'll turn white again. And so this, this darkening of the necrosis may be a, somewhat of a transient radiographic finding, but it's something that we, we um, look at as well. The other thing that you will notice is that the size of the tumor, even though we say it's treated, is approximately the same size that it is um, prior to radio surgery treatment. And that's very consistent with uh, benign, slower growing tumors. Uh, the radiation kills the tumor and turns into scar tissue, but the tumor will still be approximately the same size uh, as it was prior to treatment. The tumor doesn't necessarily get vaporized, um, but it, it can somewhat shrink over time, but the shrinkage may be only uh, you know 10% or so. It may not be noticeable. The more aggressive tumors that we treat with radiation, the more cancerous type of tumors tend to shrink more dramatically than these uh, benign tumors. And this patient had uh, no, no complaints following uh, the radiosurgery treatment, so completely um, uh, morbidity free. Uh, the second case is a case of hereditary uh, paraganglioma syndrome uh, in an 18 year old female. And so the first thing to notice is that first patient was 64 years old and uh, their paraganglioma was an incidental finding because they did not have a, a genetic uh, variation of it. Uh, but in the in those patients with hereditary paraganglioma syndromes, oftentimes the diagnosis is made much earlier because uh, the tumors are occurring earlier in life, uh, they're symptomatic earlier in life, and plus oftentimes you have a family history that you can uh, attract, which means these patients are being screened 
earlier. So this uh, patient um, at, eight, at 18 has already had uh, two surgeries, um, uh, one for a left carotid body tumor in, in the neck in January 2022, and um, a parallel in, uh, surgery on the right side uh, three months later. So uh, that's down in the neck. Now the patient has an MRI scan of the brain, and there's a third paraglioma up at the uh, skull base. And uh, in terms of brain symptoms, she's having decrease in, in hearing and a tinnitus, which is uh, ringing in the ear. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the um, treatment plan and outcomes um, in the next slide, but um, what I didn't want to point out, so this patient was treated uh, with radiosurgery uh, for this, this third tumor. We used the 21 gray in three fractions. And um, when, we, when we choose to treat in a single dose versus choose to treat in a fraction, depends upon several variables. One would be the size of the tumor. Uh, the second would be the proximity of the tumor to some of the cranial nerves. And so if we have a tumor that's close to some cranial nerves uh, that control you know, functions in, in and around the head and face, uh, sometimes we will fraction the treatment to essentially buy some safety by delivering three smaller doses of radiation on three consecutive days rather than a single high dose. So you see this is um, before surgery, I mean, before the radio surgery, and then, and then afterwards, uh, we see some necrosis going on. You see a little bit of a darkness appearing in, in the tumor. And this is early, this is only six months, so this is really not, not long-term follow This patient would need to be monitored periodically um, with MRI scans. The further you get out from the radio surgery treatment, uh, in which the tumor shows stability, the less frequently you need to scan. So if you're 10 years out from the from getting CyberKnife radio surgery for this tumor, you may not need another scan for three or four years. But in the early part where you're you're tracking right after treatment, it's not uncommon for us to get scans every uh, six months for a couple of cycles and then annually thereafter. Here's the uh, treatment plan uh, for this particular patient. This is um, an MRI, a series of contrast enhancing MRI sequences, the horizontal axial view, the vertical coronal view, and the sagittal view here. Uh, again, once again, you can see the tumor is outlined in red here, and the target dose um, to the tumor is this kind of orange line uh, around it. And again, you, you essentially you want to look, look and see how well does the orange line mat match up with the, the red line there? Um, and once again, you can see kind of the rapid fall of radiation dose. So once you're out of this darker blue line, you're talking about only one fourth of the dose of radiation that the, the, the tumor's um, receiving. Um, other, something else to note on this um, diagram, you'll see this structure outlined here, this circle here, and which is translates to this structure on the coronal view. This is the brain stem. This is what um, connects the brain and the spinal cord. It's a very important structure. So when you plan the radiation for uh, a tumor using the cybernetic, you're essentially telling the computer a number of things. You outline the tumor and you're telling the computer, please deliver a dose of 22 gray to the margin of the tumor as best as possible. But you're also at the same time telling the tumor to minimize dose to the, the brain stem because we, we don't want dose going into the brain stem if at all possible. So the tumor runs through an, an iterative process, a computer-based algorithm where it runs all the different possible beam angles and trajectories and uh, comes up with a treatment plan that is then presented to the, the radiation oncologist and the neurosurgeon to review. Uh, but the treatment plan um, does take in more than just the, the tumor volume. We, we put in what we call these critical structures um, to, to block out um, those from going in that direction. Uh, for example, some other critical structures we will block out is the eye. You know, we don't want radiation beams going to, to the eye. So that's another structure that we would block out. There's another case, a uh, third case, a 47-year-old uh, uh, female um, also with a hereditary paraganglioma uh, syndrome. 
Um, she's got a total of three tumors and has had multiple courses of radiation and uh, radio surgery and surgery. So um, if we walk through her, her history, again, these are very typical for the hereditary paragangliomas uh, patients you'll see over the course of decades are receiving a treatment every every few years or so. But uh, she started with a surgical resection of a left carotid body uh, paraganglioma in the neck uh, when she was in her mid-20s. This was done in an outside hospital. She then had um, radiation to uh, a left jugular paraganglioma um, and using IMRT, which is a more, a more of a fractionated course of of radiation and radio surgery. So she had 45 gray delivered in 25 fractions. Um, one thing you'll notice is 45 tends to be a bigger number than what you're seeing we're using for the cyber knife. And, and that's just part of the dose fractionated regimen. The more you fractionate, if you're gonna deliver 25 fractions of treatment, you have to increase the dose of, of radiation because um, the both the, the normal tissue and the tumor recover and heal between each of the fractions. So you you can't just give the same dose that you would give it in a single shot and give it over 25. You have to actually increase the total dose. Uh, the patient also underwent cyberknife radio surgery to a right vagal paraganglioma in uh, September of 2010. So uh, looking back at this first tumor in uh, the year 2000, left carotid body tumor, uh, in June of 2022, um, she didn't have any neurologic complaints, but the scan showed that this left carotid body paraganglioma that was resected 22 years before was starting to grow back. Uh, and uh, the you know, alternatives are radiate now um, because it's growing again or consider repeat surgery. Uh, repeat surgery um, on carotid body paragangliomas is more challenging than a first time surgery because of scar tissue that develops. And so it, it can be, it, it's harder to get a complete resection and you have a higher complication rate with repeat surgery. So in this case, the patient um, chose to undergo uh, cybernetic radio surgery to this uh, recurrent surgical lesion. Uh, you can see on the MRI scan here uh, on the left is the, what things look like prior to treatment. So this white, structure. The circle here is the uh, uh, paraganglioma, the carotid body tumor. These two little black circles here are the um, internal and external carotid artery. And this white structure is the jugular vein here. So a carotid body tumor always lives in this kind of sheath that has a jugular vein, the, car the carotid artery, and the, the carotid body tumor there. And uh, after radio surgery, the tumor is the same size. You see, again, the two carotid arteries and the, um, the jugular vein there. So no complaints uh, following surgery. Things are going well. Again, this is not long, necessarily a long-term follow-up. She will need to be monitored um, uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, the last case I want to talk about is a 47-year-old female with uh, hereditary paraganglioma syndrome again. She had a resection of a left jugular paraganglioma, uh, which uh, left her with vocal cord paralysis. This was back in uh, 2001. Um, the follow-up scan showed a gradual increase in the size of the right uh, uh, carotid body paraganglioma, and she had some neck pain and stiffness. So she's now faced with what to do with this new tumor. Now, if you go back to 2001, the patient is 25 years old and had the surgery, but now has a left vocal cord paralysis, which causes some voice hoarseness. And she has to live with that morbidity um, as a 25 year old for many, many decades. And so uh, when you talk about now going in on the right side, the worst case scenario that could happen is she has a right vocal cord uh, paralysis because you have two you have two uh, vocal cords and they move tend to move they, they should move together normally if one is paralyzed you only have one moving and that gives you the voice horses but if both get paralyzed it's a pretty significant problem and so in this case the stakes of a surgical resection 
are would be considered extremely high um, because if there's any, any injury to the right vocal cord, it would create a huge um, problem with her ability to, to phonate. So she underwent the radio surgery in uh, July of 2021 uh, to uh, the right carotid body tumor. And uh, once again, you can see um, the lesion. This is a contrast MRI scan. The, these uh, uh, paragangliomas light up uh, very well with, with contrast. And this measures about 19 by 13 millimeters. And uh, at 18 months, you'll notice it's not any different in size, but at least it, it stopped growing. And the function of radiosurgery is just long-term control. By control, we define that as not requiring another a treatment in your lifetime. So to, to, what we would hope to summarize today is to show you that uh, radiosurgery um, can be an excellent uh, surgical alternative uh, to patients with paragangliomas. And in many cases at, at the present time, it could be considered as a first line treatment even in, in, in front of surgery. Um, uh, there's a growing body of uh, literature that shows that uh, a radio surgery is um, not not only being non-invasive and an outpatient procedure, but well tolerated with the, uh, with high local control rates and low complication rates. Uh, but obviously, when you're managing a patient with a paraganglioma, specifically one with a genetic syndrome, uh, you really need to have a personalized um, uh, 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 evaluation with a team of doctors and come up with the uh, the best. Um, treatment options, not only factoring just what you're treating at the present, but the longer term plan to, to manage and monitor, monitor the uh, patient to maintain quality of life. Uh, thanks for the attention um, for our slide presentation. And at this point, uh, we can turn it over to uh, question and answers. All right, well, that was fascinating. Um, so, you might actually through some of these questions. Um, I, I think some of them were slightly answered, but just for the sake of uh, brevity and a place for it to be in case people want to see this going forward um, when it's being recorded. Um, some of them might be repeated. I might ask some follow ups, um, but we're going to start with the uh, pre given questions. Then I'll go to uh, if there was any unanswered ones into our Q&A section that were asked live. Feel free to put them in there. Um, but all right, let's start. So first question are, uh, what are the risks of secondary cancers following radio surgery for HNPGLs, uh, specifically for someone who may need like radio surgery in their mid thirties? What is the likelihood they would need another radio surgery in a lifetime? Again, I know some of this kind of was done in those, but just for the sake of having it in the spot. Yeah, no, this is a question we get asked frequently. Um, you know, um, I think um, folks are concerned about um, the second cancer risk from radiation. As I showed, though, um, there have now been uh, several very big studies with, you know, tens of thousands of patient year uh, follow-up of patients with benign tumors treated with radiosurgery, and um, those series didn't show any um, increase risk in second uh, cancers compared to the normal population who, um, you know, were not treated with radiosurgery. So I think the risk with radiosurgery, given that it is a much smaller area usually that we're treating and it's much more precise, I think um, a lot of those concerns with second cancers um, are much, uh, much less with radiosurgery. All right. So second question, how much is too much radiosurgery as it pertains to radiation-induced cancer? It's a great question. If um, there is. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we also get asked, you know, how much radiation can a patient get in their lifetime? And um, is there a limit? Um, usually uh, that is not something um, that is a concern in terms, you know, we have we, uh, Dr. Chang and I, we treat many patients with metastatic disease and um, we treat, uh, they may have multiple courses of radiation um, uh, in different parts of their body. I think the main concern about uh, multiple courses of radiation is uh, only if it's in the same area. So um, if we are retreating in 
the same area, then um, we are more concerned about increased risks of radiation toxicities, but um, uh, there really isn't any limit um, in terms of um, uh, how many different sites we treat or horses if they're in different areas. Thank you. Um, can treatment be done at any radio, radio surgery center or do you need to find a place that specializes in perigangliomas? Um, so I'll, I'll tackle that question. So uh, it, it, the, the way to kind of address this question is um, from several different um, viewpoints. The first is that uh, if you were having a surgical, open surgical resection, you would certainly do some homework and find out a center that, you know, manage the high volume of surgical resection. We know that the skill set of, of physicians is, is largely based on volume per year. And so in order to maintain a baseline um, good skill set, you need to be doing a certain number of these open surgeries per year. When it comes to radio surgery, one may think that just because you're not in the operating room and you're just drawing circles on a computer screen, that um, there's not that same level of proficiency. Uh, but I think I think there is. Um, in in general, what happens is the high volume radio surgery centers um, have um, an ability to treat paragangliomas. They're not super common tumors. Um, so if you um, aren't at a high volume center, you're going to be at a center that they may have only treated uh, a handful, uh, you know, in over a decade or so, which is arguably not enough to maintain the level of proficiency. So that's one way to look at this question. The other way to look at this question, though, is, um, is in the rare event that there are side effects or issues that come up following treatment, the high volume centers are going to be the best ones that are going to be able to be have the skill set to manage those. Um, I always like to tell my patients that if everything goes right, it kind of doesn't matter where you got treated. But you know, if you did have any kind of flare up or complication or some issue, you you want to be at a center that has seen that type of situation before, and that's certainly going to be at the higher volume centers. So next few questions. It tend to be around inoperable tumors. So they've had a lot, you know, uh, I haven't exactly been told inoperable myself, but a lot of people have been told this is inoperable due to, for instance, nerve damage, previous surgeries, like part of, you know, part of right paralyzed vocal cords already been done. New tumor on the left side, which seems like one of the cases was already uh, on that, but, um, is that possible for radio surgery if you've already been told it's inoperable? Um, and uh, what would that approach kind of be? So, so the kind of the term inoperable can mean a lot of different things. Usually, usually it means that the surgeon has calculated that the risk is too high compared to the benefit. Um, so it's not that the surgery technically can't be done, but the surgery, if done, would lead to an unacceptable level of complications. So therefore, we're deeming you inoperable. Um, now, obviously, if you go to a higher volume center, what is inoperable at a lower volume center may sudden, suddenly become operable at a higher volume center with, you know, with lower morbidity because of, again, the skill set of the team. But having said that, you know, we, we know from the the medical literature that surgical resection of these tumors does carry, you know, some risk of, of cranial nerve damage. Uh, Dr. Pollum's summary talked about, you know, almost one in four patients undergoing surgery came out with nerve injury. Um, so the nice thing about radio surgery is that you're, you know, the, the location of the tumor or the kind of shape of the tumor is, is or, where it is relative to the carotid artery or the skull base is really not, not as critical. And so a lot of tumors that are deemed kind of not operable in the operating room can be managed with uh, radio surgery. Having said that, just like some surgical centers may call it inoperable and another center may say, yes, we can do this. 
when you're dealing in the realm of radio surgery, you're, you're going to find uh, sometimes the same story. One radio surgery center may say, this is, you know, too big for us to manage, or we've not treated one this size before. And another radio surgery center will say, no, no problem. You know, so uh, I think if you're in a situation where you're being told that something's not operable or not not treatable, um, you know, certainly get get other additional opinions, seek out kind of a high volume center because um, they're, at the end of the day, there's very few tumors that you really cannot treat somehow with a combination of therapy, uh, particularly tumors that are progressing need to be treated. But um, certainly that that that's how I would kind of address that issue. Now, there was one question about like, I had surgery on one side and my vocal cord is paralyzed and, you know, what, about, what do I do about the other side? That That is a little bit of a challenge because now you only have one good vocal cord. And now that's on the side of, that you have a tumor that's growing that's not been treated. Um, you, you, you can't, it, it's, it's somewhat of a calculated risk, but the, the radiation risk is always lowest for the tumor when they're smaller. So just kind of waiting for it to get bigger is, is really increasing the risk of, of, of the radiation. Um, <clears throat> so knowing what we know that the risk of nerve injury is so low with the radiation, Generally, our philosophy is to still treat the tumor on the side with the with the one functioning focal for it in attempts to control it so that you don't need to have a more riskier open surgery down the line. Um, as, a, as a quick follow-up, how would you characterize high volume? Like how many per year would you say that's that's a high volume center when they're dealing with, you know, these rare? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good, good question. So there's a couple of ways to address it. Um, you know, the, because these are rare tumors, uh, even a center that's treating a couple hundred tumors a year of all different types of brain tumors may not see a paraganglioma in that. Um, so I think you you need to you need to really know how many paragangliomas they they are they're treating. One way you can look for that is to look for the publications because those centers that are treating enough that they have the data collected and can talk about their own personal outcome experience are, are publishing and you can look for that. Um, without without that, without the publication trail to go with, you're you're really stuck with kind of just taking the, the physician's word of mouth that we treat five a year or whatever. And then you have to decide whether that's sufficient enough in your mind uh, versus traveling. Now, one thing about radio surgery is because it's an outpatient and non-invasive treatment, it's very easy to travel to get it you're not going to be moving, traveling to another city to be hospitalized. You're traveling to another city for an outpatient procedure. Um, and so it's very easy to go in and out and travel in and out of the city to receive radio surgery. So it, it always strikes me as if, if, if the stakes are high and um, you know, you're worried about complications and you've been through multiple procedures already, it's, it, it, it's maybe worth seeking out a, the high volume centers um, to, to get managed. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to go lightning round, trying to get to as many as I can. So um, I, if you ask a question, I didn't get to it. I apologize. But um, here's a good one. After radio surgery, how often should a patient have a full eye to thigh scan, if any? Um, Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm going to try to type some of the answers to the questions in the QA and I guess so we can divide and conquer and try to get as many of these questions as possible. But um, yeah, I see several questions related to that in terms of um, follow-up imaging and interval. Um, typically, after our treatment, we like to get an MRI of the area that we treat, um, at least initially every six months. But a lot of these patients do have, you know, um, um, mutations and syndromes. And so um, we like to partner with the endocrinology team um, to uh, um, uh, make sure that our follow-up imaging is integrated with um, whatever scans that uh, their team is ordering. Okay, uh, are there any limitations for radio surgery for like special considerations, the size of the tumor, patient's age? Uh, yeah, so generally, in, in theory, size is is a limitation. There can be a upper limit where you know the the amount of radiation, the volume that you're radiating is is too large. Um, 
Also, it, it depends what the symptoms are. Sometimes these neck uh, paraganglions can be so large they're, they're deviating the trachea or the esophagus and causing significant issues from what we call mass effect. Um, and with radiation, um, sometimes the tumors stabilize, sometimes they shrink, but if they shrink, it may be gradually and slowly and not, not quick enough to address the, the symptoms. So it's, it's size and, and symptoms that can determine the patient's not a candidate for radio surgery. Gotcha. Um, is there any particular locations like the, the trachea where maybe, you know, I know sometimes it just depends on what's around um, where radio surgery would be better or riskier? I mean, I think that is one of the advantages of um, radiation compared to surgery, um, especially with the lower doses that we use to control this type of tumor. We can um, pretty much treat in any location of the body safely. Okay. Okay. Uh, da -da. Let me see if there's any lives here. All right. Um, now, some of these next ones have to do with long term, and I know this is, you know, some of that's been touched on, um, like 15, 20 years tumor control for the radio, radio surgery. Yeah, again, for, I... uh, for, for benign tumors, um, and again, we've blown these paraganglomas in with, with most of the other benign tumors. Um, if there is a failure after radio surgery, we typically see it in the first three to five years. Um, it, it'd be rare to have a failure 15 to 20 years out. Um, not, not impossible, but, but pretty rare. And so somebody who was, if, if they had a non-genetic non uh, paraganglioma that was treated 15 years ago, we'd be scanning maybe once every five years, for example. Um, but durability is pretty good after, once you get out past three to five years. All right. Well, I know we're getting close. So, uh, and I know Dr. Palama, you have, you have, you're both very busy, Dr. Palama, Dr. Ching. So I want to say thank you to you both for your time and dedications to our pa patients. Uh, this webinar will be available in a few days on YouTube and on the website. Uh, so sign up for our e-news and follow us on social media. Today's webinar was made possible by the generous support of people like you. If you find webinars like this one valuable, you can donate to support the program at www.feopara.org. And finally, thank you to everyone who attended. Have a wonderful four. Um, and thank you so much. Really appreciate everyone's time. Thanks so much, Ravi. Thank you.